If you think $43 billion for the national broadband network is a big investment, consider what the Navy is about to ask the government to approve. Defence chiefs are drawing up a proposal to build a brand new fleet of 12 submarines to replace the Collins-class fleet by the mid-2020s. Some experts are putting the cost at up to $40 billion. Policymakers may not be alone in flinching at that sort of expense when they consider how much of a mess defence made when it was building the Collins-class submarines back in the 1990s. Leaky propellers, noisy engines and combat systems Systems that had to be replaced because they were out of date are just some of the missteps on the way to launching the much maligned Collins fleet. Now, almost two decades on, the Navy wants to build an Australian-made submarine all over again. Peter Lloyd reports. The intention is to fire at a generated range of 10,000 yards. 10,000 yards, AC, Roger. On board the Collins-class submarine HMAS Deshano, they're rehearsing for war. Stand by to fire four tube. Commander JJ Couples and crew are going through the final checklist to unleash a heavyweight MK48 torpedo. Fire four tube. Fire four tube. It's a warhead designed to sink other submarines as well as enemy ships on the ocean surface. Torpedo, torpedo, torpedo. For the crew of the Deshano, this simulated direct hit is the culmination of one year of training and testing. Throughout that process, we engage in simulated uh, combat uh, against those vessels, um, remain undetected from the aircraft, from the ships, from the other submarines, and uh, go through the whole range of, uh, of warf warfare competencies that we have to demonstrate. Lateline went aboard Deshano to see what life was like for the crew of a Collins-class submarine. In many respects, this is an enormous armour-plated weapons launch pad. Hey, yeah. At sea, the crew work and rest in six-hour cycles. It is a punishing schedule. It takes a person who can get along with people, who, uh, who likes a challenge. Eighteen years after it was introduced, the Collins-class submarine is past the halfway mark of its life cycle. Policy makers need to decide on a replacement soon. In making that choice, an old debate will be rerun was building an Australian submarine fleet from scratch a good use of public money. We built the Collins class here in Australia. Um, that was an Australian build, and I think, I think something Australia should be very proud of. You have to ask yourself the question just how successful the Collins program has been. We spent over $10 billion on building and supporting those submarines, and there have been times in the last couple of years when there has been no boat available to go to sea. The very first Collins-class submarine was launched with great fanfare by the Keating government back in 1993. It was the first of six and the first Australian-made submarine. Controversy was never far away. Nearly $5 billion spent, the minister says taxpayers have been let down. At the present moment, they'd have every reason to question, are they getting value for money when the submarines aren't going the way they should? Ten seconds to fix. Two zero nine and a half. Today it remains a high maintenance operation with only two of the six boats available most of the time. With the Collins submarine it's an incredibly sophisticated capability and if something breaks there's no original manufacturer we can turn to and say hey how do you fix this. So it's something that we're what's called the parent navy and I think it's fair to say that we didn't realise when the Collins fleet started to go to sea just what that would mean and we've probably under-resourced it and certainly mismanaged it for, for most of its 10-year life. Is the lesson that we can do it better or that we shouldn't even attempt it? I think the lesson to take from the Collins experience is that if we're going to develop something that's uniquely Australian, we need a solution not just for the build and evaluation phase, but how we're going to manage it after that. The Deshano is typical of the troubles that face the Collins project. Hundreds of millions of dollars were spent revamping it and a sister boat during construction after they were found to have substandard engines that made too much noise and a combat system that was out of date. In 2003, the Navy almost lost Deshano. A seawater pipe burst while the boat was submerged deep off the WA coast. If that flooding had continued at the rate apparently it was, con the water was coming in, I, uh, several tons came in over a period of nine seconds before they uh, got it shut off from the external sea pressure, uh, it wouldn't have taken um, many more 
seconds or minutes before the submarine would have been so heavy that she would have been in a situation from which she could not recover. The flip side, mission success, is shrouded in secrecy. In open warfare, a Collins-class submarine may carry formidable firepower. Yeah. Uh, impact. But its primary role is intelligence gathering through intercepts. It's also capable of carrying special forces troops to foreign soil. The Deshaino's precise record is something her commander would only hint at. The whole capability, the submarine capability, is a, is a covert one. That's, uh, that's how we do our business. And uh, we've done a lot, of, uh, a lot of great things over the years, which uh, you won't necessarily read about in the paper. What replaces Collins will come down to two key questions. How far can a new boat go? And how long can it remain underwater, undetected? Uh, we need long range. We need long endurance. Uh, we need uh, stealthy platforms. And frankly, that's why we built the Collins class the way we did. Tonight, Navy Chief Vice Admiral Russ Crane makes his most explicit call so far for a mega project. Um, the distance from our fleet base in the west to our fleet base in the east is the same as the distance from London to New York. Um, if you were to superimpose Europe um, on Australia, you would see that most of Europe would sit inside Australia. So the requirement for our ships and indeed our submarines it is very different. What the Admiral wants won't come cheap. Defence procurement specialist Andrew Davies has done some sums. Um, if we do the sort of thing that we did with Collins and design and build our own, anywhere 30, 40 billion dollars is not out of the question. It's a national broadband network size of investment we're talking. There's a couple of alternatives. You could live without submarines. That, that's a choice that the government could always choose to make. Or you could buy off-the-shelf submarines, um, probably from a European manufacturer, because we'd be after conventionals rather than nuclear. Twelve European submarines, says Davies, could cost as little as $9 billion. Let's go uh, increase, say, uh, five revolutions. Coming. Commanders like JJ Couples at the sharp end of the nation's defence are not impressed by the idea of cheap alternatives that have limits on how far they can travel based on European conditions. Our coastline's pretty, uh, pretty vast. Uh, in order to, uh, to engage any potential enemy, we have to go a long way, even, uh, even to get to, to regional areas. So really, range is, is critical. A larger submarine means something else. The payload a submarine can carry in terms of the um, amount of weapons or um, mission systems that it can carry is a proportion of the size of the boat, so a bigger boat can carry more stuff, basically. Capability is not the only factor that will shape the debate. The final decision rests with Cabinet. It has Treasury advice urging the purchase of more off-the-shelf defence weaponry to take advantage of the strong dollar. Vice Admiral Crane is hoping policymakers take a longer view. This is a truly national capability um, that, that I think Australia needs and it's something that uh, we need to plan for and project for into the future. Planning is very much on the Chief of Navy's mind after a debacle over the readiness of Navy's heavy lift transport ship HMAS Tobruk. At the start of the year, it was at Garden Island Naval Dockyard for repairs. But on three occasions, the Minister for Defence was told the ship was ready to go to sea with 48 hours' notice. But it never was. Tonight, Vice Admiral Russ Crane breaks his silence on a controversy that had the opposition calling for his head. And the Minister got um, some disappointing advice, disappointing in that it was um, not advice that I'm sure he would have liked to have got. I didn't like getting it either. Um, but he got that advice, which was disappointing in relation to the availability of Tobruk. Um, but that advice was provided um, in the time frames that it should have been provided. Was anyone holding back? No, I don't believe... No, nobody was holding back. In the case of HMAS Tobruk, we had a, uh, uh, an issue with um, the hull, where some temporary repairs had been made to the hull, and that was satisfactory on the basis that the ship was going to go into dock and be... Um, and be fixed. When we delayed the ship going into dock, 
the Centre for Marine Engineering, who are the people who are appropriately qualified to provide this advice, needed to change that assessment. And that's what drove a different set of circumstances. Uh, and that happens very quickly. The immediate crisis is now over. HMAS Tobruk is back on 48-hour standby. But the furor may reinforce old impressions about how defence manages resources at a time when it's preparing to ask the government to approve what could be the biggest defence building project in the nation's history. It's a reasonable enough observation. If there are some elements of the fleet that are being poorly managed, then you have to ask the question, what will be different in the future? I am the Chief of Navy. I am accountable uh, for uh, what goes on in Navy. Uh, I accept that accountability. I accept that responsibility willingly.